Father God, you alone know the depths of each of our hearts. You have created us uniquely and know us more intimately than we know ourselves. With this in mind, we acknowledge your divine sovereignty and authority over our lives. In humility, we mourn over our sin and ask that you would forgive us as an act of your unconditional love. We echo David's cry from Psalm 51 and ask that you would create in each one of us a pure heart and a steadfast spirit that longs to see your name honored above all else. Continue to work in each one of us, Lord God, to shape us more into the likeness of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Father, this morning we lift up our link missionaries to you. This morning we pray specifically for Norm and Janelle in Kenya and Chris and Aaron in Asia. Please continue to equip and strengthen these faithful servants of you as they serve you away from home. We pray that lives may be transformed in these regions because of your work through these missionaries. Father, look with compassion on the world you have redeemed by the death of your son, Jesus Christ. Move the hearts of many to offer themselves for gospel ministry. Fill them with your truth and clothe them with holiness, that by their lives and labors your light might shine through them and the coming of your kingdom be advanced. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, we also pray for our brothers and sisters serving you in church-based ministry here in our local area. In particular, this morning, we lift up Kellyville Anglican Church and their senior minister, Dave Kuhn, and Norwest Anglican and their senior minister, Pete Stedman. Empower these men to faithfully lead their churches closer to you and help them to demonstrate your love in everything they do. We pray that they would seek your will in every decision that they make and that you would lead them and their churches where you want them to be. Help them both to be men of integrity, that people would see Christ in how they lead their churches and live their personal lives. Help both of these churches to be an ever-present light in their community, that your name would be honored above all else. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for the youth ministry that we have here at St. Paul's. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to share the gospel with the youth of the hills who don't yet know you as their Lord and Savior. We praise you for the leaders who give up their time each and every week to invest in the youth and to help them to see a clearer picture of who you are to them and how you have shown your character to them in the work of Jesus. We pray, Lord God, that you would empower the Christian youth to be bold and courageous in their sharing with the gospel Uh, with their non-Christian friends and family. Father, we also thank you for the children's ministry that we have here at St. Paul's. We thank you particularly for Linda and Nay, and we pray that you would be with them as they lead this ministry. We pray, Lord God, that you would help them to enable the children of our community to grow in their knowledge and love of you all the days of their life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And finally, God, we pray for those in our congregation who are sick or hurting. We pray that you would be with those who are feeling isolated and bring comfort to those who are unwell. Lord, would you be a refuge for those who are distraught and bring healing to all who are experiencing sickness. And we pray all of this knowing that you're a God who hears and answers our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. morning church. The Bible reading for this morning is from Hosea chapter 8 verses 1 to 6. Hosea 8 1 to 6. Put the trumpet to your lips. An eagle is over the house of the Lord because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. Israel cries out to me, Our God, we acknowledge you. But Israel has rejected what is good. An enemy will pursue him. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. Samaria, throw out your calf idol. 
My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of purity? They are from Israel. This calf, a metal worker has made it. It is not God. It will be broken in pieces, that calf of Samaria. before we begin to get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Pray that we would understand what that love means this morning, but also what that love calls us to commit in response. And it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Many of you know my wife. Uh, She's a rather prominent personality around these parts. I have a a very peculiar relationship with my wife. Probably one of the more peculiar things is that she said yes. I remember once being at another church, not this one, where we were going for a number of years, and and we were chatting to people in the post-game over a cup of tea, and... uh, this guy comes up to me, totally innocent, and he just goes, I just don't get you and Linda. And he says, she is so funky and vivacious, and you... And I'm like, do go on, Dan. Finish the sentence. Because I agree with you, Dan. This woman, that man, I mean, it's the world's greatest act of charity. I feel like I should walk around with a business card. says, Mark Stevens, officially batting out of my league. But that's not why my relationship with Linda is peculiar. Why it's peculiar is because I've made public promises to be in a relationship with that woman. I'm married to her. And every marriage is a peculiar relationship because you make binding promises in public about your relationship. I really don't do that for the rest of my friendships. Like when you're in childhood, you sometimes walk in with a parent sitting around, a cup of tea and a sticky bun. You sit there and go, this is Paul. We are now best friends. But after you're about age five, you stop doing that. You just become friends, don't you? You kind of hang out long enough with people and you kind of look at one another and you go, are we friends? Stagger me. I think we are. And it's even vaguer at the end of friendships, isn't it? Like, occasionally friendships do, sadly, end with some incredibly horrific incident or or, or some terrible breakdown, but but most friendships never really end. You just kind of drift apart, such that you're asking things like, are we still friends? So with friendship, there's no ceremony, there's no promises going in or going out. And I'm not wanting that to change, by the way. I don't want to make public announcements about all my friendships and probably nor do you. But you see, marriage is peculiar because you make promises in public about your relationship. And that's because marriage is something more than friendship. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. A covenant is when you bind yourself to someone else with serious commitments. 
Now, covenants don't have to be romantic or affectionate. In the ancient world, the world of the Bible, uh, covenants were things that nations or clans could do in order to exercise diplomacy with one another because the same basic principle applied. There are two parties that need to be bound together with serious commitments. But here's the thing. When the Bible talks about our relationship with God, it uses the language of covenant far more than it ever uses the language of friendship. Knowing and loving God is is much more like a marriage than it is a standard friendship. Now that, by the way, doesn't mean you have to be married in order to understand this. In fact, it's the other way around. You can't really understand what it means to be married unless you understand that we are all meant to be in covenant with God. And so across the Bible... God relates to his people through covenants. He cuts a covenant with Abraham. He cuts a covenant with Moses. He cuts a covenant with David. All of them involve big promises because God just doesn't say he loves people and leaves it there. He he publicly commits himself. He, He writes it down. He binds himself to his people. Indeed, on some occasions, it says that God swears an oath. Think about that. We ignore God, we reject him, and his response is to make public promises for our good. But covenants, of course, necessarily involve two parties. And our relationship with God is always and ever only a covenant relationship. And that, my friends, changes everything. Because a covenant is when you bind yourself to someone else with serious commitments. We don't drift or slide into friendship with God. We don't come to God and say, hey, I like you. We should hang out. I commit myself to him. And the story of Scripture is that God comes to us in grace and mercy with undeserved promises and overwhelming commitments to our good, and it is meant to be that our hearts and souls will say, I'm all in for you. Can you imagine a marriage ceremony where only one of the parties commits? Mark, will you love her? Will you cherish her? Will you honor and protect her? I will. Linda, do you have anything to say? No, I'm good. I mean, I like what he said, but I'd like to keep my options open. You know what I'm saying? Awkward. Knowing and loving God is more like a marriage than it is a friendship because there isn't a non-committal option. Covenants bind two things together through serious commitments. That's why you can rely on covenant love. You rest in covenant love because commitments mean obligations. God hasn't said, I'll try and forgive you. God has said, I will forgive you. I promise. I am committed to this. But the commitments bring obligations on both sides. That is what the law is in the Old Testament. God's commands are spelling out the specifics of covenant commitment. The law isn't the entrance exam into his love. It is what it means to live in his love. Because covenants are founded on commitments that bring obligations. Mark, will you love her? Will you cherish her? Will you forsake her for all others? Mark, you will have no other gods. You will not bear his name in vain. You will not lie. Now, why all of this preamble? Because in Hosea 8, it assumes you know the meaning of covenant. Hosea chapter 8, verse 1. Put the trumpet to your lips. An eagle is over the house of the Lord because the people have broken my covenant 
and rebelled against my law. Now, we're about to enter into another announcement of judgment in the book of Hosea. And when it says that an eagle is over the house of the Lord, it's talking about not a pretty eagle, but the eagle is a carrion bird. You could translate it as vulture, meaning something that picks over a dead carcass. I can't imagine it's a good feeling to have a vulture circling overhead. It's like, look, darling, vultures, they're so pretty. But zero in on the second half of the verse. The people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. Breaking covenants and rebelling against the law go together. Because you break covenants when you forget commitments. See, what does it mean that I love Linda? I love her hair. I love how she dances. I love that she has no internal monologue. Zero filter. As her heart thinks, so she speaks. That's why I like Linda. But what does it mean that I love Linda? Well, it means that the specific vows that I said on that spot over there 8,191 days ago I didn't get a computer to help me with that at all. It means those vows remain ever present to me, so much so that more than one time in my marriage, we've had to actually look one another in the eye and go, I promised to you, and I intend to keep that promise. What does it mean that I love God with all my heart and soul and strength and mind? It means I remember my commitments because you break covenants when you forget your commitments. People have broken my covenant. They have rebelled against my law. How has Israel broken the covenant? Verse 4. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. Verse 9, for they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has sold herself to lovers. Verse 14, Israel has forgotten their maker and built palaces. At least four different things that I can count where Israel has broken covenant. Leaders without God's approval. Idols sold herself to others and building palaces. The idols thing would seem to be enough, don't you think? Like worshipping other gods, making small statues that you bow down to, that's like commandments one and two. Surely you can just tap out at that point. We don't need to send that one up to VAR, you know what I'm saying? Like we've got got it covered. Idolatry and you picked leaders without my approval and you built palaces, and you sold yourself to other nations, whatever that means. Why not just say, you've committed idolatry, and we're done? Because it says something about our relationship with God that we would think that all he cares about is the narrow religious spaces in our life. That all God is looking for when you do life with him is what you do when you're at the altar, what you do on the special days, that all God cares about is that special hour on a Sunday. That's where it matters, but the rest of life is fundamentally neutral and yours to do whatever you darn well want. There are some weeks that uh, Linda and I might get like an hour with each other. Thursday night, goggle box, beautiful. People watching people watch TV. What could be better? We might only get a few focused hours with each other every week sometimes, but there's not a minute that my vows do not cover every aspect of my life. There's not a minute where the vows don't apply 
Because when God cuts a covenant with his people, he isn't asking to date you for an hour. He's asking for your life. When God covenants with Israel, he says, I will make you a nation, a nation that is different from the other nations, where you will be led in a way that will be distinct, where you will practice a hope in me that will show that your security is not in wealth or weapons, where you will show the world what a God-saturated life looks like 24-7 so that when they look at you, they can see what the reign of God looks like, that every part of your life together will sing to the world that you are my treasured possession. When Israel picks the wrong kind of leader, that's not just bad politics, that's breaking covenant love. When Israel makes military alliances with Assyria to keep them safe and secure, that might look like good diplomacy, but actually what it is is it's saying, you are not my shield, God, you are not my rock, my refuge, We need to top up what you offer. They're breaking covenant, and that's why it says you've sold yourself to other lovers. Israel's sleeping around. When God cuts a covenant with people, he isn't trying to date you for an hour. He wants your whole life. Israel is under judgment because they don't want to belong to God 24-7. Which brings me to idolatry, verses 4 to 6. They have been making these little idols out of silver and gold, some of them in the shape of a calf, which is quite remarkable if you think about Israel's history, like you haven't learnt that lesson yet, guys. But what's really scary about this passage is that Israel is doing this with zero self-awareness. Read between the lines of this passage. Israel is still turning up to the altar. Israel is still ticking people of God on the census. They're still coming to church, people. Chapter 8, verse 11, though Ephraim built many altars for sin offerings. Verse 13, they offer sacrifices as gifts to me. It's all encapsulated in chapter 8, verse 2. God, we acknowledge you, which you could translate just God, we know you. Israel has kept up enough occasional performances to blind their eyes to their underlying unfaithfulness. Like, I would feel way more comfortable, I've got to level with you, if Israel's idolatry meant that they'd given up on worship and that they'd abandoned all the rituals and that they'd stopped ticking Israelite on the census. That would be far easier. But this, this is like turning up to church because we want to date God for an hour. But we don't want him for the whole of our life. See, if I think about the clothing of marriage, there's a world of difference between, for me, a tuxedo and a wedding ring. Because the tux says, I'm here for the wedding. But the ring says, I'm here for the marriage. Now, in Jesus Christ, we continue to have a covenant relationship with God. What Jesus brings is not the end of covenant, but a new and better covenant. It's a new and better covenant because in Christ, it completely saves and renews. The covenants God makes in the Old Testament are brilliant. In fact, they they build together to form a foundation ultimately that points forward in promise to the new covenant that Jesus brings. But we need a new covenant because any honest reading of the Old Testament ultimately results in a confrontation with yourself because the covenants keep failing, not because the covenants are bad, but because of me. There's a crushing moment of realization where you have to ask, what's going to happen, God, when my commitment fails? What happens when the promises I've made to you in the past have not been kept? The answer of Scripture is Jesus happens. Jesus happens because he brings a new and better covenant because where Adam failed, Jesus didn't. Where Israel failed, Jesus didn't. Where I failed, 
Jesus didn't. And so the prophet Jeremiah, he gives us this prophetic preview of what the new covenant will mean. He announces the promise of God to us that in the new covenant, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And those promises are then said to be fulfilled in Christ in the beautiful words of Hebrews where it says Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. The new covenant is a better covenant because in Jesus, your covenant failures are not final. My Faithlessness is redeemed by his faithfulness. But it's still a covenant. And a covenant is when you bind yourself to someone else with serious commitments. And so the glory of the new covenant isn't just that it rescues my failure, it is that it renews my commitments. Because the same Jeremiah promises This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. The new covenant is better not just because it makes you forgiven. The new covenant is better because it makes you new. This is why the Holy Spirit is essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The glory of the new covenant is the gifts of Christ and the Holy Spirit. We are rescued from our failures and we are re-enabled and renewed in our commitment. The gospel is not God going soft on committed relationship. It's God stepping in to cover over my failure and then he begins to make me like Christ, the faithful covenant partner. God remains in the business of setting hearts on fire and having hearts say to him, I'm all in. Because when it comes to knowing God, there is boundless grace for all our failures, but there is no non-committal option. Throughout the Old Testament, there are these, these moments that we call covenant renewal. They're not Israel getting saved. They're Israel renewing their vows. Uh, The classic one is Joshua 24. Uh, Israel gathered together in the middle of the promised land after so much had been retaken in fulfillment of the promises that God had given to Israel. And there they stand at Shechem and in words immortalized in like a thousand Christian plaques and posters. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is saying to Israel, are you still all in or have you forsaken your first love? And our Lord, as he came to speak about the new covenant, did so around a meal that he gave us to constantly remember him by. And when Jesus ate with people, what's amazing is every sinner in town turned up at that table because it's a table of grace. It's a table that says, I've promised, I've committed, I've guaranteed that if you come to me, I will forgive you. There is no failure he cannot forgive If you've run away, you can return. If you've ignored him, you are welcome home. It's always a table of grace. God has written down those promises of grace and forgiveness. But every sinner who comes to that table is also saying, I'm all in. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For some of you, that's the song you've been singing all your days, all your weeks, all your months, all your years and decades. And so when you come to the table, it's an experience of going, I'm here again, God. 
I'm still all in. But sometimes there are moments in our lives when it's, it's the case that you're changing your tune and you're realising that the commitments made in the past have fallen by the wayside and it's a time to actually go, I want to recommit. When I got married, I stopped living for myself alone because I belong to another. Now, people who talk about, you know, your spouse is your ball and chain, you're like, do you understand what marriage is? Do you understand that we now belong to each other? When I got saved, I stopped living for myself alone. As the scriptures say, you are not your own. Or in the words of 2 Corinthians, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I belong to another, for he has promised good to me all the days of my life stretching into eternity. And I want no part of my life to sit outside his reign. I want all of me to exalt all of him for all my days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who calls us into covenant relationship, that you are committed to us and we want to commit ourselves to you because we know by your grace You have loved us with an everlasting love. You have forgiven us of all our sins. And you want us to know the delight of your rule in every last inch of our lives. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.